Hey everyone, this is Tracy Friedlander. You're listening to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. Today on the show, I have Janet Ingle, oboe soloist, chamber musician, orchestral oboist, coach, reed expert, two-time previous guest on Crushing Classical, and the new host of this podcast with her first episode launching March 3rd. I had Janet on the show for my final episode to not only promote her new book, The Happiest Musician, How to Thrive in Your Creative Career, but to announce and officially pass the baton to Janet as she takes over the podcast I started way back in 2016. On this episode, we reflect together on our journeys into entrepreneurship in the classical music space, And she shares her biggest insights she discovered as she navigated that path herself, from how to shift your mindset about what you want, to how to begin implementing your dream projects. Jenna shares her ideas for making those things happen in spite of everything classical music training said wasn't possible. Super empowering. Let's get started. Hey, Janet, I'm so excited you're here. Hey, Tracy, I'm so excited to be here. This is so great. So this is this is third time. I don't think I've ever had anyone on the show three times. I so. feel honored, I think. Yeah. Should I consider it an honor? I'm delighted to be on the show. <laughs> I always love talking with you, Tracy. Thanks, Janet. And, you know, it's really exciting because we're as we're talking about, you know, what we're, well, we already know what we're going to talk about on the show, but like kind of talking about what we're getting ready to do. It was sort of like, oh, wow, you know what? This is a really interesting podcast episode because it's my last episode on Crushing Classical as the host. And Jenna, it's your first episode on Crushing Classical as the host, because in a way we're both hosts and we're both guests on this, on this particular episode. Which is so weird and yeah. so delightful. Um, I'm so accustomed to a podcast interview being the situation in which somebody asks me questions and I blissfully hold forth for a while and leave all of the thought of editing and planning yep. and and crafting of the thing to them. And here now, for the first time, I also get to turn it around and I get to celebrate you a little bit and the things that you have been creating for this last five Thank years. You. Yeah. I, I mean, that those days are over for you. Sorry to say on the podcast, at least this podcast, you have to start worrying <laughs> about that stuff now, but it's worth it. It's, it's worth it for the conversations you'll be having. So we're going to get into like who you're going to be talking to and what do you envision for the podcast a little later. But first I want to talk about the fact that you're, you're taking over this podcast and also you have an amazing book that's just been released. Yes. And it's so in alignment. It's so in alignment with Crushing Classical because it's all about creating a career you love in classical music, which is why you've been on the show twice. And um, it's in a way, it's a new conversation still. It's, It's less of a new conversation than it was when this podcast started in 2016. But it is still, I find, at least when I've been a guest guest expert, like on um, entrepreneurship classes, people are still like, as they're coming up, they're still not totally embracing it, embracing the entrepreneurship path. They don't know, they can't really, I don't think, envision what that means or what that looks like. And what they can envision is a performing career or a teaching career, because that's who they see in their, in their, um, in their environment. And so I think what this book is about is sort of really how to think about that path how to envision it for yourself and what else like tell us more what you like what what was your intention for writing this book thank you tracy yes that's exactly what i was thinking about i i wanted to peel back the layers of what i have been doing for the last 20 some years first you know very unintentionally Mm -hmm. and then increasingly intentionally so that people could see that there is an option, that there is a way to be in classical music, to be highly successful, highly fulfilled, highly happy, Mm -hmm. and even without having won a job in a big five orchestra, even without having gotten a tenured university position, even without stepping past these 
even without winning the approval mm -hmm. of the gatekeepers that still exist in our industry, it is entirely possible to do the things that you love yeah. and to build your own career around being um, around being creatively fulfilled, around doing the things that light you up and get paid for them and live a, a comfortable and financially abundant life. And I, I chose to tell this book as the story of my various creative and business adventures, mm -hmm. because I think stories are easy, are yeah. an easy way in. People can read stories, people can pause and shut their eyes and sort of imagine what that might look like in their own lives. Yeah. And that's what I really invite people to do throughout the book. I have uh, interviews with several other amazing uh, entrepreneurial musicians, including you, Tracy, in the book, <laughs> because, you know, it's not, it doesn't need to be just about me. Yeah. Um, but the book is called The Happiest Musician because I really feel like I am. Well, you know, I, and I want that for other people. That's what I love about it, too, is that no one really talks about happiness. Which is kind of um really shocking, you know. Like I think I I think as I headed into the career path, I sort of thought to myself, well, of course this is what's going to make me happy. But then when I started doing the things and certain things about it, especially when I was really entrenched in the professional side, you know, because it's easy to be happy when you're like playing in youth orchestra, playing in civic, and like everything is super. I don't know, tailored to being the best thing. You play the best repertoire. You play, you get all these cool opportunities. You work on music and really dig in. And there's tons of time. There's nothing but time, right? Like we used to prepare for months. For an entire like, semester to give a to give that performance. Yeah. And so that's nothing like the real world. And and soon I feel that soon after being in the professional space for a while, you sort of forget about what that that whole idea of happiness, like, am I allowed to be happy? I don't know. I'm, I can be happy when, right. I can be happy mm -hmm. when I, when I win a job in a big five orchestra, I can be happy when I make X amount of dollars, you know? Right. And yet, like, here's the thing I discovered. It's still you like we we moved from chicago to south bend at a certain point in my story mm -hmm. um because the person that i thought i was when i was in south bend as a guest uh -huh. staying in someone else's home and playing the orchestra concert at night yeah. was very much more relaxed very much more um able to just sort of flow with a day and take luxurious coffee shop afternoons right, and you have take nothing else to in do. the middle of the day. Exactly. It wasn't my house I was staying in. I didn't have to do anything with that. But it turns out when we moved, I was still me. And so all of the type A crept right back in because that's who I actually am. Yeah. And it certainly, I'm still happy. Like, that was wonderful. What's my point? My point is <laughs> that that even that if your mental game is, oh, as soon as I win this next job, then I will be happy. Yeah. Oh, as soon as I get my income over a certain level, then I will be happy. Yep. Like a, a little bit I call BS on that because why not be happy now? Right. You're going to be doing the same things at a different level. Right. And, and I'll tell you what, next... like, I'm glad you said that because it's easy to forget that you'll still be the same person and you'll still have the same things in your life. So like, um, There'll be other, like, if, if the stuff you're complaining about now is this pile of things, and then you get the thing you think will make you happy, you'll still have, you, you'll probably have some of those same pile of things you complain about. And some of the other things will be new that you complain about because every situation has something to complain about. And so what I've discovered about myself through this process is you're it's exactly the same thing. Like, um, you know, I'll be happy when, or also I, I just don't want to be here anymore. I want to be in the future. Like when the podcast started, I want to, I want to be in the future when I have thousands of downloads. I don't want to be here now where nobody knows what's, what it is, or nobody knows who I am or nobody cares. Right. And so right, right. I realized, wow, like it's the same thing. It does. It's a different, it's a different context, but it's the same thing. And so knowing like going into your career and thinking like, you know, you can be happy now. And what is it that makes 
you happy? Is it someone else's thing that they give you? Maybe you earn it, of course, but but it's it's then given to you. It's this framework. You have to show up at this time. You have to do these things. And then we'll give you this amount of money. But are there uh, like, are the other aspects that make you happy things that you created yourself? And that's actually what I've discovered. And I think you have too, along the way that like, when you're, when all your eggs aren't in the basket of, I, you know, all the stuff I have to do for this job, life becomes suddenly very different because now you have some more control. And one of the things I really, really found interesting in your book was this, the part about where uh, there was a study done about the happiness level of orchestral professional musicians compared to like their level of job satisfaction was actually lower than prison guards. Yes. Yes. And, and like on the one hand you see that and you're like, what? Yeah. These people are doing what they love to do. They're making music every single day. That's what they're, that's what they were born to do. Right. And it's totally true. And yet when you play in an orchestra, like, I, I don't want to be a downer, right. but I will say that when you play in an orchestra, you are told when to show yep. up, what exactly the repertoire is. You didn't get to pick that repertoire. Yep. It could be um, gr- it could be great music. It could be music that you don't love. It could be music that you don't love that you're playing for the 20th time in your career. Yep. The conductor is in the front, and whether you like that person or not, their opinions cannot be contradicted. Yep. You're going to just sit there and do what they tell you to do. Yep. You're going to be sitting next to the same person day in, day out for maybe your whole career. And we've all heard you... the stories of people who like hate the person who sits next to them. They've had like mm-hmm. 20 years of history. One person slept with the other person's wife or I don't know. Like there's always some kind of crazy stories when you enter into an orchestra. Oh, that person doesn't talk to that person. And like the first my first experience in the North Carolina symphony sitting behind the clarinets, I noticed that the first clarinet and the second clarinet had about, I don't know, four and a half, five feet apart from each other. And I'm like, that's odd. Why do they do that? Well, turns out they hate each other's guts. It's like, really? <laughs> well, that's good for music making, right? Like just insane stuff. Insane. Right. Right. Cause you don't and get what to, I've, it, it's, you don't get to exactly. You don't, you don't, you don't have control over that thing. So what I have, but what I've discovered in my own career and what I think that you have also is that when I have something outside of the orchestra that I'm building for myself, yes, something that I can like sink all of that juicy, like, Ooh, I want to get better at this energy into something that like fulfills me in a different way or brings me uh, income in a different way. Suddenly I can show up at the orchestra and no matter what, today's nonsense is like it's not my circus it's not my monkeys and there's a whole different level of of responsibility and anxiety that goes into that yeah if i if i'm allowed to just show up for work and do my very best with the resources that are at hand that is the people that are that are around me my own ability today and you know the if i can do my best in the orchestra without actually having to take it personally yep. that the second violins are rushing right or that like the conductor isn't doing it the way I would want to want it done like if I don't have to care yes actually because I have something of my own that I can care about and that I can control yes oh it's such a liberating feeling and it goes a long way toward making me happy yes there. because you know as I was thinking as you were talking and I was thinking about taking it personally it's sort of like it's sort of like as you as you leave your amazing civic orchestra, new world orchestra, college orchestra experiences, where most likely all those little things that are happening get get handled and everyone's working together and you know you're encouraged. And the whole goal is to make like this perfect experience, this perfect performance. Well, that's actually not the goal a lot of times in a professional situation because everybody's been there. Some people are new. Some people have been there for 35 years and they all have a different idea of what's good enough or whatever. Right. And it's a totally different experience. And so I remember that shift, my initially, my initial experience moving from, you know, that kind of semi-professional to now 
I'm here and wow, it doesn't, they don't care as much. And like, I was so used to being super invested from civic and, and it was very hard. And I think a lot of people experience that. Um, but the best way to remedy that is what you're talking about. Having your own thing that you care about. Maybe it makes money, which is even better. And it suddenly becomes a thing where like, yeah, this isn't just another thing I'm doing, whatever. Not my circus, not my monkeys. I love that phrase because it's just like, yeah, there's going to be a lot of shenanigans going on. Orchestras are like big dysfunctional families. And, (laughs) and you just have to like, if you, once you can kind of accept that and, and then create a life that makes you happy, that's super, super key. So you mentioned that you, there's something I wanted to talk about because we mentioned when we were talking before this, that when we first met, we were Mm -hmm. just, we were in civic orchestra, we were freelancers in Chicago and, but you had started your read business, but it was sort of like a side hustle, sort of this thing I'm doing on the side. Like you, I didn't know you, you did that. I don't think a lot of people did. Yeah, exactly. It was, I was a little bit on the DL about that read business for quite a while. Um, And I I tell the story in my book of how exactly I got that going. And, you know, it's turned into a huge and important part of my income and my career. But at that time, it was absolutely a side hustle. It was a thing that I was doing on the side instead of making bagel sandwiches or selling tickets on the phone just to to bring in a little bit of extra walking around money. Yeah. Which, you know, everybody needs. But, you know, in retrospect, it was definitely the start of the portfolio career I have now, right. which is made up of a jillion different income streams and a jillion different um, things that I'm doing that all fulfill me in different ways. But what's my point here? I had this read business even back then. Yeah. And I was a little embarrassed to talk about it because of the sort of basic musician mindset of if you are doing something that is not about like honing your own instrumental craft to its highest possible level, you're not a real musician. You're not taking it seriously. You're selling out. And that feels crazy to me now. Crazy to me because I feel like everything I do actually enhances all of the other things Mm -hmm. and and that's what i've seen from 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 so many other people other entrepreneurs as well um not just the fact that having my own thing makes it easier for me to be cheerful and happy and bring my best self to the orchestra because not my circus not my monkeys but also that as i'm working on building for example my uh read business Oh, it improves my read making for myself as I'm working on improving my teaching, improving the way that I speak to students. um, That improves my playing Uh because I'm I'm uh, contextualizing and putting a framework on and putting into words the things that previously I had done intuitively. Um, As I work on on coaching other musicians and coaching other uh, uh, entrepreneurs, the the magic is that everything I do comes back to me and makes th- the holistic whole yes better. Yes, I love that. I really love that. And and I to speak to what you said about feeling like, oh, but I'm not a real musician if I if I'm doing this other thing. I completely I felt like I've described it as an exorcism before. <laughs> like I've had to move from like when I first started crushing classical, even like before that I I had hired a coach and decided I'm going to start doing something. And her, her direction for doing something was speaking about what I cared about publicly. And so for me at the time was classical music careers, but I didn't even, I did not have like any kind of portfolio action going on in my career. I had nothing. I just had, I'm a freelancer, but I don't really like how this whole thing has gone down. Like, I don't think I knew the full story before I started this and, oh, but I'm a freelancer, but I really want a job and like the difficulty of, of that scenario and all the things. And I just wanted to talk about it. Also, I could see now having played in an orchestra for a while at that time, 
how it, how the business side is run and, and how the marketing and how all these things. And I thought, wow, 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 wow. Why is it, why is it like that? Right. But as I trans, as I started the podcast and I started to put my voice out there, there was still part of me that was like, but I don't want people to think I don't care about playing the horn anymore. I don't want people to think this. I don't want people to think that. And it's so interesting how tied to that, what other people think is, especially in classical musicians, because our entire upbringing is, what do you think of my playing? How do you think of how I just played that? Like it's all other people's opinions. So then as you move into another direction, that stays there. It stays there. And it's really, really hard to shake. It's really hard to shake. And when I started teaching audience building, that was the biggest concern people had. Well, I can't share my expertise online because what if my stand partner thinks it's stupid or what if, you know, all the things, right. what, it, you know, and I, what will they think? And, what will they think of me? Who do I think I yes. am? Like, it's so, it's, it's so pervasive and you're exactly right. The classical music musicians are trained to ask, to ask others yes. for the validation yes, and to rely so heavily on the opinions of everybody else around them, yep. which like makes it so impressive and courageous what you actually did, which was to start a podcast talking like outside from outside of that mindset. Yes. Or like beginning to talk to outside that mindset. And like, I've, you know, I've listened to your podcast for years and listened to the way you've stepped like first timidly and then so bravely and then so just authoritatively. It took um, time, but yes. outside of that mindset, of course it took time. Yes. Yeah. And, and one of the things I love about it is that like, I mean, you as somebody who's built a portfolio career now, as you take over the podcast, you can, and I have too along the way, but you're taking over as someone who already has. So that's interesting. When I started, I hadn't. And so I was coming from the place of, I haven't done this, but you have. So I'm going to pick your brain. I want all of this stuff out there for other people. And so like that kind of brings me to something that you have in your book, which is sort of a list of how people can get on that path. And it's not to say, how do you stop what you're doing so you can do this other thing? It's how you can weave in other things. Like if you're listening to this right now and you're like, yeah, you know what? I want to be happier and I can't change my environment necessarily, but I can't like at work or whatever, but I can change my own projects, but I don't have any clue on how to start. That's what your book helps with. And there's a list of kind of pointers, I would say there's some sort of like things to ponder. And so I want to talk about each one of those things right now and just talk about like how, like kind of expand on them and, and share with me. And we can, we'll just talk about how I did it too, I guess. Um, like mm -hmm. what each thing means and how, how, how it showed up in your life. So the first one is, is just get clear know what you want and what you don't. So explain that one to me. Like what, if someone's sitting there reading your book and they see that, what, like, what do they need to get clear on? What do they, what are some of the things, and what should I make a list? Like, what are some things that, that they should do? And what did you do? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely spend a lot of time explaining that, like, especially in the part three of the book, okay. but, but there are so many ways to be a musician, right? right? You could be uh, on the stage in an orchestra. You could be at the front of the stage as a soloist. Uh -huh. You could be in chamber music. You could be a world-renowned teacher of the of the art of music. You could be a composer. You could play in pits. You could play, you know, so below the stage, away from the, the prying yeah. eye of the audience. You could be a recording artist. You could show up. And that is just in the realm of being like an actual musician that, yeah. that sounded wrong but you know a, a performer being a performing or a musician yeah exactly that that's all part of the traditional career path any one of those things could be a, a respectable maneuver right. for a musician who is still in the musician mindset so a first thing to ask yourself is what is it that you actually want 
would all of those things be equally great for you? Because they wouldn't for me, right. actually. And I love nothing more than playing the oboe, but I get bored in, in pits. Right, right. And, and I get restless if I'm not the center of attention. And like and I need teaching in my life, but not so really much. Is, right? Like, you have yeah. to redo things over and over and over sometimes. But, you know, yeah. what, as you list off those things, I thought to myself, you know, there's so many examples in this podcast of people like that have to- chosen some of those options you listed mm-hmm. off outside mm-hmm. the path. Like, for example, someone listening to this might have heard your performance examples and say, well, I can't be a soloist because I didn't win a major national co- international competition or I can't be a chamber musician because I haven't been invited to play with, I don't know, the American Horn Quartet or whatever. And all of these things are untrue because I, I've talked to people who have started their own um, chamber music tour where they've per- like they've, you know, Kate K- K-I-N is one of those people. Like she just decided, hey, you know what? I like playing solo and chamber recitals. I'm just going to start my own series. I'm going to call up the community theaters or whatever and go around and do those things. And like there's several soloists like. For example, Hunter Nowak is someone who plays solo piano, not in concert halls most of the time, but outside in nature with a Steinway. Yes. Like, and right. he invented like, that business himself. So like anything that you're drawn to, like absolutely don't say to yourself, well, I can't do that because, because there's an example exactly. of someone who has. Exactly. And the other, the other magic of getting clear, and I, I haven't even talked about the, the options that are, you know, sitting slightly aside yes. from and parallel to performing, which, uh, of which there are myriad. There are as many options as there are people yeah. in the world. But the other magical thing about getting clear is when you're like down in the, when you're down in it and you're working your various jobs and you're waiting for the next thing to happen, The next thing that happens could be a call from a contractor saying, hey, can you come and do this thing? And like, maybe you can, but do you want to? There's, it's, it's worth being clear about where your actual end goal lies and what kinds of things that you have in your mind that are going to progress you toward that goal and what kinds of things are not. Yes. Um, Yes. Because every, every job that you take is an opportunity to do that job and more opportunity may come from it, but it might be leading you in a direction that is not actually well suited to you. Yes. I mean, so many examples are coming to mind where maybe you're not deciding if you want to be a soloist at some point, but maybe you're just saying, Hey, do I really want to do that church gig for a hundred dollars in the suburbs? Um, because right. when in fact, right, when instead I could, when instead I could stay home on that Sunday morning, yes. I could have three hours, four hours with my family yes. instead of a hundred dollars. Yeah. And like what, which, which is more important to me? Yes. And every, life is made of choices. We're, we're making decisions all the time. And the more clarity you have around what you actually want and what is important to you and where do your values yes. lie all of that is is allowed to factor into the decisions you make. And, you know, sometimes the economics are the most important thing, and that's also okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that kind of leads directly to the second one, which is know what you need to thrive, not just survive, but to truly thrive. So tell me more about that one. I find in my own life that I absolutely must have some kind of balance. Like I'm, I'm a very high functioning person. I can be busy and I can do a lot of things and I can do things well. And like, it might appear that I can just sort of keep running, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And, and I cannot actually, the elements that actually make my thriving life include enough sleep at night, include um, having healthy food in my body, yeah. include being able to exercise, and for sure include solitude. I love my family, I love my colleagues, I love the people that I work with, my clients, my students, they're fantastic. And I, if I cannot have enough time to myself to be creative in, to practice in, or just to like literally be, I am not thriving. And you're right, those two things do come together really, really well. Yeah. Um, but 
but the more I got aware of it, the more I realized that, oh, right now, here today, I'm in a dysfunctional place because I just snapped at my child for, you know, asking for a cup of hot cocoa, which is a perfectly reasonable request. <laughs> and I bit her head off, and that's not necessary. Yep. So I wonder how, in what way I am not thriving right now. That's great. That's so great to, to be able to reflect like that. And to catch yourself, you know, it's very true. Mm -hmm. It's so true. So, so how about number three, let things evolve. You don't have to burn down the whole place and dramatically pivot. Oh, I love this one so much. Maybe just try something new (laughs) and see how it fits. Me too. Because, because I think sometimes when we imagine ourselves starting a business, starting a side hustle, like we go right to, okay, well, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have this business, and then I'm not gonna be an oboist anymore, yeah. or I'm not gonna be a horn player anymore, right. um, or. But what's gonna happen to the the jobs that I'm doing right now? Do I have to quit everything? I don't I don't know how to quit everything and then like build a new business. I don't I, I, I can't afford to not do my jobs right, right. while I'm building this business, and I'm such a fan, actually, of what is the what is the easy way to just start. What if in your imagination, you see yourself 10 years down the road with this thriving online empire in which you have a blog and a video channel and a podcast and a read making business and a book and some students and a coaching business. Like what if you had in your mind that 10 years from now you were going to have all those things, but right now you don't? What could be a way to just one at a time sort of lean towards those things that you want and begin to develop them knowing that the size and the scale will come. I love that. Yeah. Because that's exactly what happened with crushing classical. You know, I, I started Mm -hmm. it. I had no idea how to podcast. I had no idea how to interview people. And, and I still was a freelancer and I still had maybe some students and you know, I just started to think, well, maybe I don't want to teach beginners anymore. Like I was sort of definitely starting to sort out what I want and what I don't want. Right. Mm -hmm. And I now had a family, like I had a kid. So I was like, well, what do I need to thrive? I know I need to be, I know I need to have time with her. Like it's not okay with me to be on the road all the time. So that was like, I was sort of saying no to like far away gigs and all kinds of things like that, you know? So, so, but, but it was definitely an evolution. Yes. It's not that suddenly you said, okay, now that I have a kid, I'm just going to stay home all the time and I won't take those gigs. Yeah. No, it's that you said, okay, this gig isn't going to work for me right. because it means I'm going to be away from home for 10 hours. Right. So I'm going to turn that one down and I'll still take something else that's going to come up closer to home. And yeah. I'll still, maybe I'll still t- start the podcast because I can do that by having an hour long conversation with somebody today yep, and then editing it tomorrow and releasing it soon. Like I can, that is a thing you can figure out how to do. Yes. And, and every, every choice you make either takes you towards or away from the thing that you want, the thing that you got clear on yep. the ultimate career that you intend. And, and also it's in your control when you're when you're evolving rather than burning the place down and starting up i i just spoke with somebody who like desperately wanted to quit their job and like replace all of that income with uh with a, a new thing that they designed for themselves and i said that's fantastic i can absolutely imagine that happening for you but what what would it be like if you kept your job for now and built up this other thing and figured out exactly how much income you need to bring in does it mm-hmm. need to fully replace the job could it be like what what is an amount that would let you know that you could quit the job right for example like all of i love the i love the idea of evolving and building something a little bit gently along the side until you know that it's right for you until you know that you can commit to it until you're ready to burn the other burn the other thing down exactly exactly so so i think um i think the next one really kind of effortly effortlessly ties in which is i mean if you're wondering how do you how do you let things evolve be curious 
Mm. This is especially powerful when things feel bad. What is the worst part of this? How could it be better? So that's a good question. So in, in what ways were, would you say you were curious as things were evolving for you or, or how do you kind of frame this one? Well, for example, um, I created this program way back, way before the pandemic called Reading Circles. Mm -hmm. They were about making reads and I would collect everybody, uh, I'd collect everybody I could find together in a room uh, once a month and we would just all make reads together. Mm -hmm. It was not curriculum based, it was just social read making. And when I had a large teaching studio that was all like local in person, that worked pretty well. I could offer the thing, they would all show up and then I could also sell tickets to it to the to right. people outside of my immediate studio so lots of people were getting help and what actually happened is that as my teaching studio dwindled by design i was trying to i was trying to uh, evolve out of doing that right. um the reading circles dwindled and dwindled and dwindled and the obvious reason for that to be happening is just that geography is really a problem for oboists. There's not enough people in a given community. There's not, everyone's far apart. And, you know, you're not going to drive 50 miles to make reads once a month right. when you could just do it at home, even if it was, even if you didn't have company. So it was a failing enterprise. And I was working on getting, and I was getting curious. I was thinking about how to how to end it and the pandemic ended it for me like oh dear oh well uh -huh. um and but if i if the pandemic had not ended it for me i would like to think that i could have gotten to the thing that i have that i in fact have now which is a read club where people meet on zoom for an hour and a half every single week and we make reads together and it is social and it is uh supportive and it keeps people accountable and there's a, a big group actually of very friendly very happy read makers who meet every week we have an absolute blast zoom was the answer mm -hmm. the to the question of right. why isn't this working geography is the problem my point is that when you have something that just feels bad that feels like you're sort of dragging yourself to it every week mm -hmm. it's worth asking like what is it about this that is so unpleasant? Right. Um, I had I mentioned that I downsized my teaching studio and then in fact ended it altogether. The uh, the model of teaching in which we met every single week, yeah. you know, in exchange for for an hourly rate. Um, I, I'm not doing that anymore at all, and I got rid of it because of the way I felt every Sunday before leaving to go and teach 10 students on Monday. It's not that I didn't like the teaching. Every minute that I spent with my students was really fun and really engaging and really life-giving. But the way I felt all day Sunday with the dread of the day ahead of me and the dread of the energy that I was going to expend on these students and the dread of the drive home afterwards where I was so fried I couldn't even see straight, mm. that's the part that wasn't working for me. And so, you know, I did a lot of experimenting in previous years, right? I experimented with like keeping all of the students together in a block. So I'm like teaching this one, the next one, the yeah. next one, the next one, break, next one, next one, next one, next one, break. And I experimented with giving myself 15 minutes between every lesson. I experimented with giving myself half an hour between every lesson. And now I just don't teach on Mondays at all. And it's great. <laughs> so much better. Um, the, the model now is that the, people that I teach come to me maybe once a month and we join each other on Zoom and I have a minimum of a half an hour between sessions and never more than two of them in a day. And I can bring such great energy to them and they to me. And it feels affirming and life-giving. That's so great. And beautiful. And it works and for you and your life and what you want. And it works for me in my life. Exactly. what I want. Exactly. So that's, that's, pretty much kind of maybe a similar answer for the create structure, our next one. Create structure, nurture small habits and simple routines that keep you moving forward. So probably not the routine part, but you created a structure that works for you for the mm -hmm. teaching so that it's 
you can handle it and that makes you happy to do it. What about the small habits and simple routines? Like what are some good examples of that? Well, you know, I wrote this book, right? Um, <laughs> the one that we're talking about yes. right now. Well, I did it in an hour a day. In Okay, great. It took me about a month to write the first draft. Took me, you know, I, I sent it out to some people. I wrote another draft. Again, hour a day, pretty much every day. Yep. And I found that, be and I had that because I found a writing group that just met at 1030 every day. And I showed up and I got it done. And you would just um, write in silence with each other? Yep. Well, that's cool. Yeah, it was actually, it was terrific. Um, I guess to, also to structure, I would say things like you, you might look at my life from the outside and say, when does she do all of these things? She's got the, the solo stuff, the orchestra stuff, the teaching stuff, the read making stuff, the video channel, the soon the podcast. Like there's a lot going on. Yeah. I send a weekly email. I do blogs. But what I have is a structure to my days and a structure to my weeks that even though it will change from week to week a little bit because, you know, different people come in in different times, different yeah. gigs happen in different ways. I know, I know that on Wednesday I'm writing an email to my list. I know that on Tuesday I'm doing my banking. I know that during the, that I don't, aside from today, I guess, Tracy, <laughs> um, that I don't do calls before <laughs> noon or before one o'clock. Right. Um, like I, I know when I have time to do those things. I know yes. that I make my reads after dinner and that I sort them the night before the shipment. Like I know how th there's yeah, enough structure. So you in know it. exactly so, what you can and can't do in a day. Exactly. Which is great. Exactly. Yeah. And that's really important if you have multiple things going on. That mm -hmm. was a big adjustment. Just having an idea for when they, having an idea for when they, when the things will fit in my life yeah. before I agree to them. Yeah, that was one of the biggest adjustments I think I had because when you just have to show up to a gig and you have a schedule all mapped out for you, you just do that. And then the rest of the time, at least I, that's how I was before I had my extra things I was doing. You just do whatever you want in the in-between times of your gigs, mm -hmm. of your rehearsals and stuff. And so a lot of people run their lives like that because they don't have other stuff going on besides the gigs. So when you do start adding new things, you have to decide, hey, when am I doing these things? And when am I not doing things? When I first started my, you know, entrepreneurial activities, I was like, oh, wait, I want to do this. I, I, and I would just stay up until two in the morning sometimes. That does not mm -hmm. work. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? it, that's not a way to thrive, right. or at least not for me. It's not for me either, but I, it was new to me. So I was like, oh, I, I have this time, you know, no, no, mm -hmm. that's not how you could, that's not how to thrive. Exactly. So one of the things, find your people or no, I skipped one, get help. <sighs> get help is so important, right? Find it's a coach, so ask somebody for help. So how did you do this? Like in different stages? You know, I was, I was doing everything myself for such a long time. Right. And, and as musicians, we have, uh, we have this teaching that once you get out of school, and once you are finished with with your degree program, you are now a finished product and you're out in the world and you just have to sort of do it. Like there's not, yeah. we, we don't have a lot of structure for taking ongoing lessons, getting coaching as musicians. Like this is not a thing for us. Right. So the first time I really remember this magic happening was I'd been running my read business for a really long time. Somebody reached out to me who also had a read making business um, who was an oboist, who also had an MBA. And honestly, I'm not sure why she reached out to me originally. I don't, I don't recall what the, what the impetus of that conversation was, uh -huh. but we had an hour long conversation and she just sort of dropped these hints about how she was running her business, what she was, what things she was doing. And I was like, oh, 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 <laughs> these are things I could do too. I could bundle some of my things together to make a more attractive offer for people. I could create remaking kits that that wouldn't just be about people ordering a knife and then coming back and ordering a plaque. I could bundle them together and <laughs> make it an attractive package. Like it just hadn't occurred to me because I didn't have a business background. I was just making the whole thing up as I went along. Yeah. And you know, since that time I've been in so many coaching programs which have been 
just astonishingly helpful, helping me to pop outside my own like internal musician mindset yeah. into ways that I could be more helpful to other people. Um, I was in a business coaching program that helped me to put structures around my that helped me to like understand what was actually going on behind the scenes in my business and put structures around the ways that I was reaching out. Um, I did a program with you where we where I learned a lot about visibility and how to use social media more intelligently than I had been doing it. Like, get help. There are yeah. so many ways to get help. Right now, my social media is, like, I, I create the content, but it's run by my VA. And as a result, like, if you were to scroll back in my social media, please don't, for <laughs> uh, more than a year, you would see that everything is very handmade and clunky and features pictures of my dog with with captions about my oboe life. Right. And all of a sudden, a year or so ago, everything got real pretty <laughs> and branded. And it all sort of matches and aligns and looks professional. That's all my VA, because I can't do that. Yeah. And it's she's worth every single penny. That's so great. That I, pay her. I love that. It's so great. It's so nice to get help. Oh, it's so nice. It's, unbelievable to get help yes. and so I'm, I'm addicted now to like just reaching out that goes along with getting curious too like as things are not working for me i try to stop breathe and zoom out and say what is happening here and and is there somebody who could help me with this yes. because i don't have to do this alone right i love that i love that and oh. and it's and it's along the lines of find your people too number seven find your yeah. people and surround yourself with people who support you so, and find your tribe, your partner and your audience. So this was a big deal for me when, when I was just getting started and in a way, like we already knew each other, but we refound each other as entrepreneurs, as people who were doing things outside the traditional path in classical music. And I think that was really powerful for a while. We did our social media army. Remember that? I do. That was good times. Yes. And super important for anyone who wants to build an audience. Listen, getting together and saying, hey, you're doing this thing. I'm doing this thing. Let's comment on each other's posts. Let's support each other. Like that was just everything at that time. When you do all that work on social media and you're actually getting comments mm -hmm. because your friends are commenting and that helps the algorithm and all of it. Like it was pretty it was pretty powerful at that time. And, and mm -hmm. we just like, just knowing you were out there doing all of that stuff, it inspired me to keep going. So I think this is really, it's really one of the most important things on, on this list here. I think it is too. Um, because so often when we, when we go to work as musicians and we show up in the orchestra, we're surrounded by people who are fully bought into the idea of performing as a career we're not always surrounded by people who are also looking outside right. of that. Right. Right. And, and like, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of time, I mean, not a lot of times, all the time in an orchestra, you don't choose the people who you're with. And a lot of, most of the time you find your, you find your people in that group of people that you're friends with mm -hmm. and sure. stuff. But like you said, there, there are a lot of, a majority of the time, those people aren't going to be also entrepreneurial. So it, they might look at you with a blank stare when you tell them about your, I mean, I experienced that. Oh, I'm starting a podcast. Sure. They're like, what? What's that? Like, why? Sure. Like, they just don't, does that make money? That's what they would say. I'm like, um, yeah, I don't even feel like explaining it to you. Like you need to be around people who, who get it and who are doing a similar thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Who are putting, who are putting themselves out in the arena yeah. as well to, uh, to, bring in that metaphor. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even to go right back to, to being a musician, you want to surround yourself by musicians who, with musicians who are better than you, who are as good or better than you, yep. instead of being, instead of making your career as the ringer in the local youth orchestra, <laughs> right? Like, it's fine. You can do that. There's money there. But the but the magic for you for your own personal development which is the most like exciting part yes. happens when you're surrounded by people who are more advanced than you are yes who can help you to like see that next level and come up to it 
Yes. Um, and that's what I think both of us have discovered in our in the various coaching programs we're doing, and certainly in the conversations that you've been having in Crushing Classical. Absolutely. Like, it's it was a really I don't know if it was intentional or not, but but somehow you have managed to surround yourself and have amazing conversations with people who were ahead of you in the game. Very intentional of entrepreneurship Jenna. and very very intentional. Yeah. Yeah. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. Yes, it's like they say that like the you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? And so mm-hmm. for me, getting getting people on the podcast who were already have already established something really amazing. Those were definitely the people I wanted to talk to because those were the ones who had answers to my questions. As well, yes. they were people who had audiences. So mm-hmm. there's nothing better than when you're building an audience than to get around other people with audiences that, that maybe there's a crossover there. Maybe there's a, maybe there's something that, that can align. A lot of times I think musicians think in terms of competition, like, oh, you're doing this Mm. thing and I'm doing this thing and it's the same. And so we, or it's similar. So I can't associate with you because your people might be some of my people and we, and we're in competition. So and it's not like that. It's not like it's that not like in that. the entrepreneurial space, really. No. You know, if no. you lift up it's other not people. Like, and it's not like that even in the musical space, actually. It's not, but it's perceived like, like that, I think. Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the last thing is just start. And, and I, I really love this one, at least for me, because that's how the podcast started. I just started. I reached out to people. I said, hey, do you want to be on, on my podcast, even though I didn't have a podcast yet? It didn't exist. But when you tell people that you have a podcast, they say, really? That's cool. Okay. Let's make a schedule. Let's make a plan to be for our interview. And then you're like, oh, wow, it's happening. You know? So what's an example of your just start? Oh my gosh. Well, I just started my read business, which, you know, has with like one client, right? Who was like, I can't make my own reads because I have, you know, maybe she had something Purple tunnel or yeah, something there like something that? Yeah, there was something with her hands, uh-huh. but um, uh, uh, there was something with her hands. And I started with her, and then when I wanted to expand, yeah, like it was scary, but I just started. I wrote a letter to some oboists and said, hey, I can do this for you. Would you like this? Right. Just started. Um, when I started my YouTube channel, like I didn't know how to make a video about read making, but I had people had asked me questions, and I wanted to answer them, right. and so I figured it out and I made a video and then over time it got so much better but it started and actually let's just say everything I've done everything I've created I've created before I was ready yeah everything I did I've started before I was ready like I don't I don't advocate for starting your process with logo design, business cards, and a new website that you build out fully, I recommend that you start by having a conversation with somebody and seeing if you can help them. I recommend that you start by doing the thing, by by preparing your recital performance and then like booking a venue and just doing it. Because action begets action. You learn from doing it. You learn what you want to do better. You discover what didn't work. You get curious about it. Um, but I think people can get paralyzed by all of the unknowns and you won't know everything before you start. Just start because then then you can evolve or you can decide that it's not for you and you can stop. That's also allowed. I love that. But you don't know till you try. Right, right. And that's the other, th- I love what you just said. Like you can just stop. <laughs> if you just mm-hmm. start and it's really not aligned, Mm-hmm. You know, which I'll, alignment is a really big thing for me right now. Mm-hmm. Um, realizing like what's aligned and what's not aligned. You can stop. You can evolve, and that's what that's what I love about what's happening right now with you taking over the podcast. Yes. Like realizing, yes. Um, you know, right now the for me, I'm aligned with something else. Tracy, will you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yes. So, you know, it just, one thing I realized probably at the beginning of last year, maybe middle of last year, 
was that I was much more interested in business for, for not just for musicians, but for all people. So it's not like I'm not interested in business for musicians at all. Like, but I just felt like my conversation had evolved to, you know, a new place. I found myself, I I joined a group program, a coaching program that was not for musicians and all the people in there. I mean, obviously there were no musicians in there and I was much more interested in, especially the coach too, like how he was bringing in people to his program, what it was about. Um, And then I did another sort of mini kind of group program that had to do with copywriting and marketing. And I, and I, at that, in those experiences, I just realized, wow, I really, like, I'm really drawn to this. I'm really drawn to thinking outside the musician sphere. And, but at that time I didn't think, oh, I'm done with the podcast, but less and less, I was, I was less and less motivated to reach out to new people to be on the podcast. And I'd finished the last season, which was season five. And actually I still had a couple episodes that I hadn't published because I started to take action on the other thing on like, what does this mean for me? What does it mean if I want to grow my audience outside of musicians, if I want to serve a bigger audience? And so as I was doing that, I just, I was sort of like, well, you know, I feel in my heart that the podcast needs to have, I just need a break from it. I want to figure out what this means. Maybe it means a new podcast. It definitely means a new direction in my business. And, but I didn't know what that meant at all. So then, Mm -hmm. then after those group programs, I ended up hiring some private coaches and boy, that was a journey because I started something and then realized maybe this isn't aligned after a while. Like, and how I knew it wasn't aligned. I got into a terrible funk where I was like, I just felt like, wow, I don't feel happy. (laughs) I feel stressed. And Mm -hmm. I thought there was something like, I don't know, just not aligned in the stars. And actually I have a friend, I have a friend here who's a, uh, really, really into astrology. And she was like, oh, well, you you know, from time to time, she'll say to me, like, you, are you feeling like this? Because, you know, this isn't your chart or I'll say like, I've just been feeling so out of it. She's like, well, that's because, you know, this, this, and this, Mm -hmm. and you'll feel better by like, literally she said this to me you'll feel better by October 5th or something. I don't know what day. And I was like, (laughs) really? Okay. Well, that was like two weeks away at that point. And I was like, God, I hope she's right. And what's really weird is like some stuff happened right before that. And by the time that day came, I actually did feel lighter and like more just like out of the, Mm -hmm. you know, fog. But at that time, I just sort of felt like the podcast can live on it can stay there. I would periodically check the stats and every, every month, lots and lots of downloads. People kept discovering it, even though there hadn't been Mm -hmm. a new episode in a long time, which I -hmm. actually knew this about podcasting from Jason Heath. Cause he told me he took like a two year hiatus from contra-based conversations. And then he came back to it and the downloads were like even better than they were before. Hmm. And then he just kept growing it. So that's one thing I love about podcasting is that it's it's a little different from like, if you took a break from Instagram, even for a week, you would see mm-hmm. a different engagement the next, when you came back. So that's a cool thing, but off on that's sort of a tangent. The point is, is that, <laughs> is that I didn't really worry about it. I was like, it'll live on. If I decide to come back to it, that's cool. I know from my other conversation mm-hmm. that it'll be fine. You know, I wasn't worried. And mm-hmm. so I just, I just left it there. And then as I sort of discovered the new kind of path, which is really along the lines of helping coaches and consultants build out their programs and and do the right kind of messaging and marketing. So sort of like a a package where you're, where I'm helping people with those kind of things outside the musician space. Um, So if you're a culture consultant listening to this right now, 
following up with Tracy would be real smart. Carry on, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, because that's one of the biggest things I learned about creating a group program is the content you put in it is really important. And one of the mis- big mistakes I made many times was giving too much because you think, oh, I just want to give everything to these people. I want them to have all the things. I want them to succeed. And actually sometimes, most of the time, when you give too much, it gets people overwhelmed more than mm-hmm. knowing what to do. Yeah. So, so as I started to dig into that with my own coach, like what goes in here and what doesn't, what helps people learn better. And with some one-on-one clients, I really discovered like, oh, like I can't just explain this in like contextual terms. I, I really need to give them examples. I really need to have them mm-hmm. doing specific things and really see what this looks like with this actual example. And I started to think about like, how could I teach this in a group program so people can create amazing content? And so that's where it started, but then it sort of evolved into helping people with messaging and it's still in an an evolution process, but Mm -hmm. it became clear to me when you announced your book, I was like, oh my God, it was like a light bulb went off over my head, like ding, you know? And I thought, I wonder if Janet would like to continue crushing classical because this is so aligned with everything you talk about in your book. I mean, it's like the history of crushing classical. You could probably point to each one of those interviews and something in your book. And that person did like what I talk about in the third chapter or whatever, you know? Yes. And so that's when we had a conversation and it just became so obvious that that it was, and you were interested, which was key because some people are like, I don't want to deal with a podcast, you know, but you were like, I think I want to do this. I, I, I think it would be great. And so I'm thrilled because I feel like, I feel like this podcast has a potential to like, say you carry it on for five years, 10 years, however long you feel like it. And then maybe someone will come into your life and you'll say, <laughs> is it, is it time for that person to carry it on? You know? Excuse me. Yeah. So that's one thing about podcasting is that it is work, but, but the way that this is being handed off, I feel like, Hey, this, like this could have actually go on after Janet's done with it. Say you decide, Hey, this is no longer for me. That could happen. And it could be like an actual movement. Like it just keeps growing and evolving. Just like the topic of the podcast, just like the topic of the podcast, just like everyone's portfolio career is allowed to just evolve. Yes. 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 I love the thought of this podcast as sort of an extension of the the message that I'm putting out in The Happiest Musician. What I was trying to do in the book is make it visible and possible for people to find their own path to their own like thriving, fulfilled, happy. Yeah life because musicians are amazing right musicians have have these superpowers they can do lots anything. of skills so yes exactly so many skills and some so many of them just don't see it yep. so w- what i hope to do is to just sort of use this as a platform to keep peeling back those layers a little bit to bring on people whose portfolio careers we can absolutely celebrate and Ask them how they did that. Yes. Where's this? Where did this come from? Where did the idea come from? How are? How did you? What was your first step? Yep. I love that. I love that so much. So your first episode will launch. I think it's March seventeenth. If I'm March seventeenth, I think yes. Okay, great. That I think is correct. So I'm I'm looking to do biweekly episodes, and this one that we're talking about right now is coming out on the third. I think. Yes. Yep. That's right. So, so this is so great. Um, where can people find your book? My book, The Happiest Musician, colon, How to Thrive in Your Creative Career. Um, it's available on Amazon, both as a paperback and a Kindle, and it's available on my website, JanetIngle.com. That's great. Will that ever be an audiobook? I mean, it might, but there is no immediate plan to do that. I love it. I love it. So what else? Do you have anything else you'd like to promote? at the end of this podcast episode? I would love to um, let people know that if they want to follow this, uh, to follow this podcast and get information in their email inboxes about this, 
Let me make some kind of page that might be. Go in the show I'm going to make a page. You have a couple of weeks. It'll yeah. go in the show Yeah, notes. so in the show notes, there will be a link to stay in the loop on Crushing Classical episodes and all that stuff with Jenna as she takes over the podcast. So exciting. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, I'm thrilled. Thank you so much, Jenna. And to all my listeners up until now, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for making Crushing Classical what it is today by listening and sharing it and having uh, writing reviews and all of those things. I thank you. And Janet, I know you will, you will do me proud with this podcast and I'm just thrilled. So thank you so much and best of luck to you. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you for the five years of love and labor and effort and energy that have gone into this podcast so far. I know that it was your baby and I will take care of it. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.